Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and you can just call me Gene. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with new ones. <laughs> Today, before we begin, I want to share with you a very popular historical sermon illustration. It's been used for many, many, many years since the birth of our country. It kind of threw me for a loop because I started second guessing myself on some of the details. And so if I get them wrong, well, you can just complain to me after the service directly. So, <laughs> anyway, so if you're familiar with American history, and it turns out a lot of people aren't because I was asking questions this morning and no one could really give me the answer. But Crossing of the Delaware River probably saw the painting. I'm assuming that these two events are connected. Otherwise, blame all the pastors who came up with these illustrations before me. But anyway, Battle of Trenton, New Jersey. Right, so I think I got it right. Military people, is that correct? Across the Delaware River. Anyway, Trenton, New Jersey, there's this German commander, commander over even the British troops, General Rall, or no, Colonel Rall. Colonel Rall. And he's there hanging out, playing cards. He's assuming nothing's going to happen. People are giving him some warnings. He's largely ignoring it. So he's in the middle of this card game, and a courier comes to him with an urgent message. What does he do? Puts it in his pocket. Doesn't do anything about it at all. Finishes his card game, takes the note out, reads it. Uh-oh, <laughs> well, General Washington's coming. But it's too late. So it ends up costing him his life, a whole bunch of his men, and everybody else is captured. It was too little, too late. It was written about him later, and I'm not sure, I tried to look this guy up too, Nolbert Quayle, but the statement is poignant. Only a few minutes delay cost him his life, his honor, and the liberty of his soldiers. Earth's history is strewn with the wrecks of half-finished plans and unexecuted resolutions. Tomorrow is the excuse of the lazy and the refuge of the incompetent. So it's a very strong statement. But as we're seeing in the rest of the story, how true is that? When we look at the biblical history, very true. We see a lot of putting things off, a lot of procrastination. Well, it's not happening to me now, so I'm good. But they're not. So we're going to continue. I'll do a little recap. If you're totally new and this is new to you, I try to kind of anchor it to David because a lot of people understand, you know, King David. So if you go back a little further, you may not know they want a king. So you start reading 1 Samuel. Right? So he's the prophet that anoints King Saul. But they're warned, like, you don't want a king. But they reject God. So ideally, the right way to think about the Bible is that we don't want a king. We want God. God should be enough. And that's right from the Garden of Eden all the way through when they start asking for a king. That's the problem. God is not enough. Right? So, fine, I'll give you a king. Don't worry, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And so this is what happens. And then it just goes down. So for hundreds of years, that's what we've been looking at, this whole history of just the decline. They end up with a civil war. Even Solomon's not so good because of him, Rehoboam, and all the, his ancestors. Bad, bad, bad. So the kingdom splits. Israel in the north falls first. In the south, we're looking at Judah. Now we come to the point where it's the end. It's just about over. In the series, we've been weaving the prophets through. Right? The Bible is not chronological, and even some of the books of the Bible are not chronological. So you've got to take the prophets and put them back in. So we looked at Daniel. We looked at Ezekiel. We looked at Isaiah. Before that, then we looked at Jeremiah. Now we're going to continue looking at Jeremiah. So here's the thing. It gets confusing, but the backdrop here now is that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, took away Jehoiachin. And so there's a king with Ezekiel over there, right? There's also a king, Zedekiah, the puppet king that he put in charge. So that's just, just the context of what's going on here. That's what's going on in the background. So what I did because of these parallel accounts, I made you a chart. <laughs> All right, the jokes about the cartoon uh, are done. I'm done with those. So we're just going to move on, but I didn't draw that. I can't draw like that. But I made the chart, and like I got about halfway through and wish I didn't. 
<laughs> it's very confusing. So about halfway through this series, or where we are now, I got a parallel Bible. Someone asked me, is there a chronological Bible? Finally found one. I was like, okay, this helps a little bit. But some of the places I was like, I'm not sure about this really, right? So I got another chronological. I actually one gave it to me, actually. It's a very old one. And I'm like, goody, another chronological Bible. No, it wasn't good at all because the two Bibles don't disagree. They don't agree with one another. So even scholars cannot make up their minds on this and where it goes. So I tried my best to put this together from scratch for you, but it's so much that you can see there's two columns, right? So one, two, then you got to move over and go down. And you can see how some of the books of the Bible, they run in parallel, right? And then all of a sudden it breaks and we got to hop over to Jeremiah. But you see, even when you're in Jeremiah, it's not chronological, so in order to put it together, you have to start like tearing out pages and putting them, don't do that, and putting them back, just, you can use the chart. If you want the chart, it's in the app, or it should be in the app. If you really, really want the chart, you can email me, right? So come up to me after service, we'll exchange information, and I'll email it to you. Did I say email it to me? I don't know. Anyway, second guessing myself a lot today. So as you can see, Really difficult to put together, but it's interesting, and that's how we're going to run today. Don't worry, I'm not going to read all of it to you. We're going to get out of here in time for lunch upstairs. Um, one thing to note, if you're a real Bible nerd, I left out some of the prophecies to the other nations. So what I want to do, you got to balance this stuff like chronologically and topically. And so I want to focus on Zedekiah and Judah, right? So I don't want to get too distracted. But I told you I'd send it to you. You don't have to write it down. <laughs> Diligent student. Keep writing. It's good. I like that. <laughs> They're great. But anyway, so... I'm just, I want you to focus on this particular part of the story, right? So if you start jumping around too much, you're going to be like, you know, wh where are we? It's already very confusing. So we're going to start off here in parallel-ish. So we're going to go to 2 Chronicles 36, and here we have Jeremiah 52 and 2 Kings 24 kind of lining up. Put that up on the screen there. All right. So I'll do 2 Chronicles first because there's some different-ish information. Zedekiah, so that's the king, the puppet king that's left there, was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. But Zedekiah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and he refused to humble himself when the prophet Jeremiah spoke directly to him from the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, even though... He had taken an oath of loyalty in God's name. Zedekiah was a hard and stubborn man, refusing to turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. So similar information in the next two, and then it gives us kind of like a window into what's going to happen, right? He's finally banished, right, from his presence and sent, gets sent into exile. So there you go. We get the point. Moving on. Now we'd have to go boop, and jump over to Jeremiah 37, just like that with the noise and everything. Jeremiah 37, 1, Zedekiah, son of Josiah, succeeded Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, <laughs> as the king of Judah. He was appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, but neither King Zedekiah nor his attendants nor the people who were left in the land listened to what the Lord said through Jeremiah. Getting a theme here? Not listening. Nevertheless, King Zedekiah sent Jehuchel, son of Shelemiah, Zephaniah the priest, son of Maaseah, to ask Jeremiah, please pray to the Lord our God for us. Jeremiah had not yet been imprisoned, so he'd come and go among the people as he pleased. At this time, the army of Pharaoh Hophra of Egypt appeared at the southern border of Judah. When the Babylonian army heard about it, they withdrew from their siege of Jerusalem. Then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The king of Judah sent you to ask me what is going to happen. Tell him, Pharaoh's army is about to return to Egypt, though he came here to help you. Then the Babylonians will come back and capture the city and burn it to the ground. This is what the Lord says. Do not fool yourselves into thinking that the Babylonians are gone for good. They aren't. Even if you were to destroy the entire Babylonian army, leaving only a handful of wounded survivors, they would still stagger from their tents and burn this city to the ground. So you are done. So what does it play here and get confusing with all the names, right? So Jehoiachin was taken away during this first kind of siege going on, right? They're still doing it. They're still attacking Jerusalem. Well, you may think Ethiop or Egyptians, how are they helping these people out? Well, it's hundreds of years, right? So after, you know, God redeems them from Egypt. So they'll make alliances with other countries to kind of save themselves. And that's one of the alliances they have. So now during the siege, the Egyptians come and it kind of scares the Babylonians away. Just think of it that way. And what is said 
to Jeremiah from the Lord is like, "Uh uh-uh, they're not going to help you, right? So when God sits out to punish them, that's it. It's going to be final. So that's what you have in your mind. But this is very, very unpopular. (laughs) So prophets, not popular people. Jeremiah 37.11, when the Babylonian army left Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's approaching army, Jeremiah started to leave the city on his way to the territory of Benjamin to claim his share of the property among his relatives there. But as he was walking through the Benjamin gate, a sentry arrested him and said, you're defecting to the Babylonians. The sentry making the arrest was Arijah, son of Shalemiah, grandson of Hananiah. That's not true, Jeremiah protested. I had no intention of doing any such thing. But Arijah wouldn't listen, and he took Jeremiah before the officials. They were furious with Jeremiah and had him flogged, like beaten and whipped, and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan the secretary. Jonathan's house had been converted into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a dungeon cell where he remained there for many days. While he's in prison, Zedekiah is kind of curious. Right? So he sends for him all the time. He's constantly asking him questions, right? So do you have a message from the Lord? Yes, I do, Jeremiah says. He's like, you will be defeated by the Babylonians. Now, Jeremiah then levels his complaint. Why am I in prison, basically? What crime have I committed? Why am I here? I'm going to die if you keep me in prison. So Zedekiah, at first, he's like, okay, let him out, give him bread as long as we have any, right? So just take care of him, and he puts him in better quarters. He puts him in, like, the jail in the palace. So it's nicer. It's more comfortable there. But here's the thing. Jeremiah has some haters. So if we turn the page, Jeremiah 38.1. Now, Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jehukel, son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, son of Malchijah, don't try that at home, heard, or do, heard what Jeremiah had been telling the people. He had been saying this, is what the Lord says. Everyone who stays in Jerusalem will die from war, famine, or disease. But those who surrender to the Babylonians will live. Their reward will be life. They will live. The Lord also says, the city of Jerusalem will, be, will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon who will capture it. So these officials went to the king and said, sir, this man must die. That kind of talk will undermine the morale of the few fighting men we have left as well as that of all the people. This man's a traitor. King Zedekiah agreed, all right, he said, do as you like, do as you like. I can't stop you. They're kind of reluctant. So here's what happens. It's not funny. Actually. They take him and they lower him into, it's a like cistern, but picture a well with no water in it. What's at the bottom of a well that used to be a well? North? Lots of mud. So picture like quicksand. He gets stuck down in the mud and they just leave him there for dead. They're like, you're done. So Really horrible punishment. But, interesting little sidebar, Ebed Melek, it's an Ethiopian court official, comes in. So he's not one of them, really. But he comes in to try to save him. And he goes to the king and tells him what's going on. The king says, okay, take 30 men, go save him. But he does an interesting thing. He's smart. He's prepared. He goes and gets some rags, essentially. Because he knows, well, how are we going to pull him out? All right? Not with chains and a winch, right? So we're going to use ropes. But what are the ropes going to do? They're going to hurt when you try to get them out of the mud. So he throws the rags down and has them cover his arms with them. So not only does he save him, he's very, very kind to Jeremiah. Right? So Jeremiah, it says, was returned to the courtyard of the guard and placed in the palace prison at this time. So now what you have is, again, this back and forth between Jeremiah and the king. He's sending for him. And at first, he's like, you're not going to listen anyway, right? You're not going to listen to my advice. So whatever, you know, what, why should I bother? But he says, no, I, I want to know. And he lets him know, basically, you need to take this punishment. And it'll go well for you. But if you keep rebelling against, if you stay here in the city, not so much. Even the women are going to taunt you when this happens, right? So what's the idea? The big idea, again, is that they're supposed to take this punishment, but it's not yet really coming for him. So Zedekiah thinks, like, I'm just better in my current condition. He's also afraid of the other exiles that are there, right? Remember, he's the puppet king. The real king is there with the exiles taking the punishment. So they might kill him, he thinks. So the idea, again, going back, like, what is going on here? Like, why is the Lord, if you're new, punish him? Remember, these people have done horrible things. 
They've killed their children. So they're not just worshiping other gods like we do in church, right? They're, they're really like putting their money where their mouth is. They're killing their own children to these gods, and that's detestable to the Lord. That's very wrong. That's just one of the things that they're doing. So, and when they run out of food, what are they doing? Eating their own children. So it's just, they're terrible. They deserve this punishment. And the idea is that God, and he can use anything, is using the Babylonian king to enact this punishment on them. That's it. He's a tool for the Lord. They need to take it. So the equivalent of like Zedekiah would be like, hey, go in time out. And your kid goes, nope, I'm staying right here and watching TV, right? So that's, that's what's going on here. They're being stubborn. They're not taking it. But there's extreme procrastination going on here. He figures, I'm good. It's not happening yet. Okay. So now if we jump around, I'll give you the chart for just a second because this is where if you look at the top middle, that's where Ezekiel came in. So I haven't been doing this completely chronologically, again, because I want you to get the topic, right? So we saw two different things, the watchman on the wall, right? And then we moved on to Ezekiel. The bulk of Ezekiel happens a little bit later. So this was the watchman on the wall stuff and the Ezekiel bread. Remember, we talked about that. Kind of funny. So that's where that happens. And then we go back to Jeremiah 27. And so on Jeremiah 27, this message came to Jeremiah from the Lord early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke and fasten it on your neck with leather straps and send messages to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, Sidon, through their ambassadors who have come to see King Zedekiah in Jerusalem. Give them this message for their masters. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. With my great strength and powerful arm, I have made the earth and its people and every animal. I can give these things of mine to anyone I choose. Now I will give your countries to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who is my servant. I have put everything, even the wild animals, under his control. All the nations will serve him, his son, and his grandson until his time is up. Then many nations and great kings will conquer and rule over Babylon. So you must submit to Babylon's king and serve him. Put your neck under Babylon's yoke. I will punish any nation that refuses to be a slave, says the Lord. I will send war, famine, and disease upon you, <clears throat> upon that nation, sorry, until Babylon has conquered it. So, a yoke, <laughs> not an egg. Right? So, it's something that, like, two animals, you put that over them so that, you know, you can use them. They stay in the same direction to plow a field. Right? So, you're going to be put under a yoke like that, like plowing slave animals, right? That's the idea. Well, there's a lot of false preachers out there. And so there's warnings about that, right? False prophets. They're promising that there's going to be prosperity. So that's the backdrop here. <clears throat> so Jeremiah 28.1. One. one day in late summer of that same year, the fourth year of the reign of King Zedekiah. So you see the timeline moving. King of Judah. Hananiah, son of Azor, a prophet from Gibeon, addressed me publicly. So Jeremiah talking in the temple, while all the priests and the people listen. He said, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. I will remove the yoke of the king of Babylon from your neck. Within two years, I will bring back all the temple treasures that the king Nebuchadnezzar had carried off to Babylon, and I will bring back Jehoiachin, so that's one that's away, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other captives that were taken to Babylon. I will surely break the yoke that the king of Babylon has put on your necks. I, the Lord, have spoken. So we know it's not true, right? Because <laughs> what Jeremiah said, right? On behalf of the Lord, not true at all. So we've talked about this a lot in the past, right? These false teachers, lots of them out there. And so it's both sides of the coin. As Christians, we're going to have times where we have trouble. And then there are going to be times of prosperity. And we just hope and pray for that prosperity, right? And so Jeremiah kind of does that. He shows up, he's like, amen, Amen. I hope what you say is true. That would be absolutely wonderful. But there were many prophets before me and you who prophesied disaster. Right? So it's a, you're not telling the truth. So he leaves, but then the Lord says, go back <laughs> and tell him that, you know what? You've broken this yoke. So Hananiah takes it off. He breaks the wooden yoke. Left that part off. Breaks the wooden yoke. And so go back to him and said, all right, You've broken the wooden yoke, but now I'll replace it with a yoke of iron over you. And you know what? You're going to die because you're a false prophet. And sure enough, two months later, he's dead. So that's the episode there, warning against false teachers. 
So now, if you wanted to be real chronological-ish, you'd go to Jeremiah 51. Uh, essentially, the crux of that, again, it's like one of these uh, warnings to the other nations, but there's some interesting imagery going on. Uh, write this down for Babylon. And so tie it to a brick, the message on the scroll, throw the scroll into the Euphrates River, and it's going to sink. And in the same way, Babylon will sink, never to rise again. That's Jeremiah 51 in a nutshell. Again, Ezekiel 5 through 23 is probably here. Now we see the Babylonians come back, and the siege begins again. So Zedekiah, he rebelled. So on January 15th, during the ninth year, see the time move along, of Zedekiah's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon led his entire army against Jerusalem. They surrounded the city and built siege ramps against its walls. Jerusalem was kept under siege until timeline 11th year of King Zedekiah's reign. Note to self, to the note takers, this is probably-ish where Ezekiel's wife dies, chapter 24 of that book. Now, they're under siege, Jeremiah 34, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came with all the armies from the kingdoms he ruled, and he fought against Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. At that time, this message came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go to King Zedekiah of Judah and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to hand this city over to the king of Babylon, and he will burn it down. You will not escape his grasp, but you will be captured and taken to meet the king of Babylon face to face. Then you will be exiled. So, a little too little too late. King Zedekiah tries to free the Hebrew slaves there, so they have their own people that they're enslaving that they really shouldn't be doing. And so you see this throughout history. When someone knows they're going to be overwhelmed or overcome, they'll let the slaves go and things like that, uh, every man for himself, or maybe they'll fight for us because they have some type of investment here. So that's what happens. Jeremiah 32, though, it's too late, so we'll hop over there. <clears throat> There's the land purchase. Kind of interesting. In the 18th year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, and the 10th year of the reign of King Zedekiah, just before it falls in the 11th year. The idea here is that the Lord tells Jeremiah that his son Hanamel is going to come, and he's going to say, buy my field, bless you, at Anathoth, right? So Anathoth is interesting, Jeremiah 1.1, that's where Jeremiah is from. So remember, he was trying to leave through the Benjamin Gate and go, that's like where he's going to get. So there's this land transaction, we see Baruch or Barak show up again, we talked about him in this series, right? So the point here is that it symbolizes, he's going to buy this land, he buys the land, and then he makes a declaration right in front of everybody. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Take both the sealed document and the copy of it and put it in a pottery jar and preserve it. Why? Because you're going to be restored. Someday you're going to come back here and you're going to have that property. So, you know, prove that you own the property. That's really what's going on here. If we continue... Right through 32 and 33, we have Jeremiah's prayer. There's some recalling of all the great things that God has done for Israel, but despite that, they have been disobedient, but <laughs> despite that, they will be restored. And so that's kind of the pattern of the prophets that continues on and on. We see kind of a cool messianic uh, prophecy. Um, it says that in the future time, the descendant of King David's line will come. He's going to be called the Lord is our righteousness. So prophesying about restoration after the 70-year exile, but then even better in future restoration. So finally, we come to the end of it. By July 18, in the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign, the famine in the city had become very severe, and the last of the food was entirely gone. Then a section of the city wall was broken down. Since the city was surrounded by the Babylonians, the soldiers waited for nightfall and escaped through the gate between the two walls behind the king's garden. Then they headed toward the Jordan Valley, but the Babylonian troops chased the king and overtook him on the plains of Jericho, for his men had all deserted him and scattered. They captured the king and took him to the king of Babylon at Riblah, where they pronounced judgment upon Zedekiah. They made Zedekiah watch as they slaughtered his sons. Then they gouged out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. Jeremiah lets us know he remains there, blind and in prison, until his death. So the last thing he sees is his family getting killed. Just to mention here, we did this in the series before. Uh, a lot of different versions of the Christian Bible have been around for years. That may shock a lot of people, but the earliest copies of the Christian Bible going down to like the mid 300s, uh, they will include more books than a lot of people have in their Bibles. Uh, if you look to more modern times, 1560, King 
uh, well, actually, the Geneva Bible, that has more books in the Old Testament, and so does the 1611 KJV. More books in there. So among those books, you're going to find like the Epistle of Jeremiah, reflecting on these things, um, Lamentations of Jeremiah. But in most all Bibles, you're going to find Lamentations right after Jeremiah. If you finish Jeremiah, you get to a five-chapter book, Lamentations, and there are these like psalmish laments, like songs of sorrow about what just happened. So we're not going to skip those books. I'll acknowledge them. You can read them on your own. So we see that there is a huge danger in procrastination, a huge danger. And we see that a lot through this series. Some kings, they last a long time, right? And then some kings, they do okay, like King Hezekiah. But what's the thought? At least it won't happen in my time. I'm good. It's still a form of procrastination that lands on somebody else. Interesting. And the prophets... They're begging these people, right? risking their lives to see it. They're like, no, it's not okay. Stop it. Right? They're like couriers to General Rawl. Hello, are you seeing this? This bad stuff is going to happen. Well, it's not happening now, so eh, whatever. Right? So here's the thing. We talked about the watchman on the wall. All right, so last time, when God calls us to do crazy things, we did this huge chunk of Ezekiel. But if we go back just before that, the watchman on the wall. All right, and now here's what happens. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a secret about preaching. Because <laughs> sometimes people will say to me, you're not going to say that, are you? Right? Oh, okay. I shared this with my wife. You can go as hard as you want. Because the majority of the room is thinking about someone else. That's what's happening. They got someone else in mind. So you can say something hard, and they're like, oh, yeah, that person's doing real bad at that, right? So that's it. They're displacing it. Let's not do that, right? So we're all the watchmen on the wall, right? That's Christians. That's what we are. We're the watchmen on the wall, and we got to tell everybody, right? <laughs> You're going to hell. You know? Like, that's, that's our job, right? We got to get out there and do that. And what, I did a good teaching on that, I think, right? Yes. Yes, but we have to do it lovingly. <laughs> That's the way. And once they've heard it, they've heard it. The blood's not on our hands, but we just like keep doing it to the same family member, right? Like over and over and over and over and over again. Does, it just gets them more stuck in the mud. <laughs> Doesn't get them anywhere. How's it working? Have they changed their mind after like 30 years of saying the same? No. No, right? But we're the watchmen on the wall. That's how we picture ourselves. Okay, how about we turn it around? What if instead of the watchman, we do that? What if we just hold up a mirror, right? What if the, we're the, the ones, the recipients of the warning? Let's look at the other side of that today. It might be healthy. So Zedekiah, he was warned, but he procrastinated, right? Doesn't heed the warning. And there were others that were happy to encourage him to stay put, like Hananiah, the false prosperity prophet. But it had consequences. They were warned, but they didn't act on it. So again, theme of the watchman. A lot of people don't know Ezekiel 3. That's where that is. It comes up again in Ezekiel 33. Then after it, we see this. Pay attention. Ezekiel 33, 30. Son of man... Your people talk about you in their houses and whisper about you at the doors. They say to each other, come on, let's go hear the prophet tell us what the Lord is saying. So my people come, pretending to be sincere and sit before you. They listen to your words, but they have no intention of doing what you say. Their mouths are full of lustful words and their hearts seek only after money. You are very entertaining to them. Like someone who sings love songs with a beautiful voice or plays fine music on an instrument. They hear what you say, but they don't act on it. But when these, peop these terrible things happen to them, they will, as they certainly will, then they will know a prophet has been among them. So they listen, but have no intention of doing what you say. Ezekiel? I feel you. <laughs> Are we any different in the church today? Are we any different, right? We're the watchmen, right? But 
Are we any different? And this is a big thing we asked ourselves. We did a Corinthian series like 10 million years back, right? So you don't remember it. But anyway, this was the thing, right? So a lot of Christians, if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians especially, you know, they're crazy. And so I did a whole book and a whole series, Those Crazy Corinthians. Are we any different, though? So I know the book pretty well. First four chapters, it's all about pastor worship. Do we do that? Pastor worship, all right? Do Christians have, like, this person that is just, like, one little hair away from God, right, that they worship? Doctor something so-and-so, or bishop, apostle this, that, and the other thing. Pastor worship. Paul's really upset about the pastor worship, really upset. They're like babies, he calls them. Should I come at you with a rod? He's upset. I'm glad I baptized none of you. He's mad about it. Who is Apollos? Who is Peter? Who is Paul? First issue, are we any different? Five through seven. Main issue is lawsuits at the top six. Main issue, sex. Are we any different? Eight through ten, meat sacrifice idols, overlying context. What is that? Well, they're squabbling over secondary doctrinal things. Paul's worried about the church splitting. He wants unity. That's happened like 40,000 times since Paul. Right? Why? Because we squabble over non-gospel things. Right? Most you know, Christian, if they're real Christian churches, you know, they'll tell you they, they preach the same gospel, but they preach a whole bunch of other different stuff, and they've split over it. Are we any different? In that context, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. So he's talking about the Israelites, right? He's talking about things in the past and how they're being disobedient. And he says something important of them. These things happen as a warning to us so that we would not crave the evil things as they did. Wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. But, as I think Benjamin Franklin said, Experience keeps a dear school, but fools will learn in no other. A lot of people ignore these warnings because nothing really bad is happening right now. Like Zedekiah, right? Still got my palace, I've got all my stuff. I'm good. Nothing bad's happening. Yet. People ignore the warnings because they're in this like little comfortable space. It's not that bad. But yet, you're eligible too. Right? You're a watchman on the wall. Careful. Remember to be humble and receive the warning. It's not happening yet. So maybe the consequences haven't come yet. But what happens when the future becomes now? Now. Just because you don't feel the consequence immediately doesn't mean it isn't impending, that it isn't coming. And as we can see, long, drawn-out consequences. Sometimes the longer you stay in that complacency, that sin, whatever it is, the worse the consequence is going to be. Sometimes the longer you're in that, the worse it's going to get. As we can see here, sometimes it enables the procrastination keeps you there. But we must live in the now. And so we got a little sidebar story, Ebed Melech, right? He sees the now, and he goes for it. He doesn't waste any time. And so there's one of those little acronym thingies. Now, no opportunity wasted. Yet, how are we wasting opportunities that God's just practically spoon-feeding us? So here's the thing. You may still have time, but maybe not much. So if that's you, you've been putting things off, procrastinating. If you're hearing this in your breathing, if that's you, breathing, <laughs> you still have time. You still have time. But now, now. And I've said this in the past very quickly. You see a lot as a pastor of a church. A lot. 
And some of that is death. We're all going to experience it. And some of that happens early, and it's sad. But it's not so sad, like Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 4. Right? We don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. Hebrews 10, doesn't matter how bad it gets, because we know that there are better things waiting for us. Paul, Philippians, better for me to go and be with the Lord. That is the proper Christian attitude, right? So sometimes it is comfort that leads to complacency. It can cause us to procrastinate. So we looked at Revelation last week, and we're going to hop there. So the seven churches. And so basically, if you don't know much about Revelation, uh, the first three chapters are basically like report card letters to the early church then. That's really what it is. Seven churches there. And five of them, <laughs> it's essentially like you did this well or we're doing that well, but, and then all the bad things they're doing. Only two churches get past. We'll go to the last church, Laodicea, Revelation 3.15. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit or vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And don't you realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Jesus points to the spiritual. I advise you to buy gold for me, not literal gold, clearly. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also, buy white garments from me, so you'll not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes, so you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Basically, when are you going to learn? Why aren't you doing anything? Because you've been comfortable and distracted, lulled by the enemy into indifference. That's what's going on here. There are many today in the modern church who are doing the same thing. This letter could just be, we change it to Naples. Big problem here, actually. That's one of our like, top problems. That's a problem. They've been enabled to procrastinate because they're in a very comfortable place. Eh, put it off. And again, <laughs> this is a real thing. In Naples, there will be plenty of prosperity teachers to tell you, you're fine. You're good. In fact, keep piling on more of that stuff that's causing you to procrastinate. Let's focus on that. Those who are not focused on that have the real faith. That's what faith is. The things that are not seen, that's where your focus is if you have faith. Think about it for a second. Kind of logical, right? But Jesus, despite his warnings... He's calling me, wake up, stop it, <clears throat> don't listen to Jesus, <laughs> you know, don't take the warning as we get to the end of the book, the conclusion of the Bible. If you're indifferent, it's not okay. Comfortable place can be a dangerous place. Jesus tells us why. If we go to the beginning of chapter 3, Revelation 3, 1, write this letter to the angel of the church uh, in Sardis, or it could be Naples, right? This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold on to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. And that is not Jesus' first warning. That's just as we get to the end. As we get to the end. Right? So if you go to the Gospel of Matthew, it's in there. Lots of warnings. I think of Matthew 24. If we go to the Gospel of Mark, Mark is often called the Gospel of immediately. And it's not necessarily if that, is, that word is used more than in Matthew, but it really stands out. It's only 16 chapters as opposed to Matthew that's 28. And you just see everything happening immediately, even that word being used a lot in a good translation. So Jesus, the, the, the Spirit, immediately, he's baptized. He immediately comes up with the Lord. The Spirit's immediately on him. And then he's going out. He's getting his disciples, right? So you have Simon Peter and Andrew. He calls them, follow me, right? And immediately they follow. Immediately. 
right? So John, James, they're in the boat mending the nets. Follow me. Immediately, they leave the business. So you got to think about it. All these guys have a fishing business, right? You know, it would be like, and don't do this if you work for someone else. It's not nice. Give two weeks' notice. But anyway, <laughs> if it's Jesus, right? So you have this business. It's really important to you. Like Jesus is like, nope, come follow me. Immediately, immediately, they leave. Literally drop the nets, leave me on the boat, bye, called right out of the world. <laughs> immediately, immediate, immediate, immediate. It's like that. It goes fast. Why? Well, Jesus tells us. Matthew 13, 34, the coming of the Son of Man. Now, he's talking about now his second coming. He ascends, goes to heaven. We're not sure when he's coming back. Please stop speculating about it. And he's going to come back. But the point is, be ready. Be ready, right? He's coming back. We're waiting for that. can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do. And he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. You, too, must keep watch. For you don't know when the master of the household will return. In the evening, midnight, before dawn, or at daybreak, don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you, but I say to everyone, watch for him. Jesus instructs us to stay alert. Be ready. What did he say in Revelation? Meet the requirements, right? Now, we are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. Keep reading Ephesians 8, 9, and 10. We are created. Why? Well, for good works. That's what it says. Go and read it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Some people, that's it. Why? For you are God's masterpiece or craftsmanship created for good works. That's the rest of it. And if we read all the way to Revelation, ah, you're going to see. In heaven, it says, the liars won't be there. That's what it says. You get to the end of that book. So what you do matters. What's the thing here? Well, you know, there are a lot of people calling themselves Christians. But if you're a Christian, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what are you going to do? You're going to produce fruit. That's what Jesus says. Judge a tree by what? The fruit. Not what they say. <laughs> James, you can't just be a hearer of the word. You need to be a hearer and a doer of the word. Wake up. I really believe in a large way that's what the church needs to hear. So as we close, let's reflect, me, all of us, all of us. Like what, what can we change to be less conformed to the world, Romans 12, but transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in that chapter, so that we can even love our enemies. We've been through that in this series. It's an important chapter of the Bible, right? How can we just humble ourselves to see ourselves not better than everybody else, to see our own character defects, reflect on them, and ask the Holy Spirit to change them? So that we can, we can bring people in through love. That's how it's done. Through sacrificial living. That's what's important. Let's be mindful of God being watchful. Remember Ezekiel and the whirling wheels? And I explained that the eyes, what did that represent? He can see everything. He can see everything. We need to be mindful of that. Right? It's important. Now, right before I close today, I just want to, because it's a tough message, but it's kind of what Jesus says over and over and over and over and over again, right? So why should what I say be any different? That would be highly problematic. So I want to invite you to be the church. So if you're not, so if you come here when I do in the morning, kind of early-ish, it's great because you just see a very active body of Christ. You just see people without being told what to do. They're just doing stuff. And that's kind of how we operate here. They're up in the kitchen. They're making food, all this different stuff. So there's food for you, and it's good, right? So they care. It's like, ooh, there are going to be some hungry people here or just people I want to fellowship with and love on. Good. Let's make food for them. Right? And you see people during the day. They're just running around, cleaning the bathroom, whatever it is. They're just doing things, right? They see a problem. They just fix it. That's it because they are the church. So I want to invite you into that, to be the church. Get into service somehow, right? Maybe there's something you do. You can bring a gift, a talent to the church. 
something we've been looking for. And if you see stuff, it's a pastoral technique. Sometimes you leave a mistake somewhere so that someone goes up to you and says, hey, did you notice this, Pastor? I said, oh, good, I was looking for someone to take care of this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Watch what you complain about because sometimes you're being set up. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so call to action. We're just a very, if, if you saw our website, you should read the website if you haven't. We are not trying to be a mega church. I'm not trying to be rich and famous, been there, done that. Right? So if you know my story, my past, I'm over it, right? So done with that. Our vision, this room fills up. We have a couple of overflow areas. That's it, right? That, that's it. If I can't remember your name after like three or four tries, I'm not your pastor. That's it, all right? So I hear about this guy's pastoring me, like, on the Internet. Like, no, 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 you know? A, a real pastor, pastoring all my people. I know you. You know me. What? We're developing relationship. And so that's one of the things I just want to share with you. So after the service today, if you've never met me, you want to come up and meet me, that's fine. <laughs> we can exchange numbers. I, I text out a proverb every day to my people. I know it's not an automated. My wife had to remind me of that. Like, they don't know, some of these people, that it's not automated. It's not automated. I pray for every single one of those people. I'm praying for you in the morning, sending the proverb out. So you want my number? Fine. 7 to 7, Sunday through Friday. Otherwise, leave me alone. I need some family time, right? So anyway, it's a lot of hours. So I love you, all right? And that's how we do it. And so you're going to start there, right? Get involved. You can fill out a card if you're shy or worried about getting bit. Um, <laughs> or a connection card. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> or through, through the phone, right? You want to do that? You know, so like you're just like, I don't know. I'm going to talk to that guy. He's crazy. But <laughs> last week, the unfortunate couple, like they just said hello to me and they ended up talking about or hearing about the Bible for like an hour. My wife's like, you got, we got to go now. All right, so that could happen, but if you like that, you're good. Anyway, through your phone, connection card. That's it. I want a Proverbs Debo. I need prayer. I want to get involved. I know some of you got to go. That's fine right after church. But during the week, you're going to be told about opportunities you're going to have to serve. Really important. I just want to end with just this encouragement to you. I showed it or I had them show it like two or three weeks ago. But here's the thing, right? A lot of people complain about the school district. What are we teaching kids in school? And then go on and on, right? And so they're writing nasty letters, posing things on the Internet, picketing in front of the schools, all this stuff. Does any of it work? Never. <laughs> Never. And in fact, it infuriates these people into doubling down. That's what always happens. So they're going to make it worse. So what do we do? And people ask me, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to love on them. We're just going to love them. And they're going to ask why. And that happened. That happened. It was amazing. So check this out. You want to bring God back into school? Yeah, it ain't working the way you're doing it. We did this. And we found out that there was a need at the school. We found out that Christians, they're like, they pack the backpacks, they put all the school supplies in there, and the schools are like, no, we give those to the kids anyway. Like, that, that's not the problem, but you keep spending thousands of dollars on it and giving us backpacks we don't need. What do you need? Ah, not, not well, <laughs> stuff we really don't want to deal with, right? So feminine and hygiene products that for middle school, that's a thing. I'm like, okay, check, all right? Socks. We're in Naples. Ah, there's a part of Naples that we don't want to look at, right? So that's going on there. Socks, shoes. We're running out of shoes for the kids. We're like, okay. So we put together a whole bunch of this stuff. We had some kits we had. We like to help people who are experiencing homelessness. And we sent that to the school. That's it. And what we, we didn't like stick like a Bible verse in there that they're never going to read. They don't know anyway. No. No bait and switch. No strings attached. Just send it to them. They know this is a church. They're talking to my wife, you know, pastor's wife, right? Okay, sent it to them. We got back a letter on Collier County Public School, letterhead, talking about God. Now people will know where to go when they need help is basically the crux of what they were saying. See how it works? Results. So... Just went a little bit longer today, but I think it's worth it, right? Praise God. Praise God. Don't worry, we'll feed you afterwards. Too. Praise God. That's how you make God known. Through love. Just love them. Love them. Love them. That's my encouragement to you. So effectively, just together as a body, that we're getting stuff done. That's what you're supporting when you support this church. That.
We want to be just a beacon of light in our own community. That, and we support foreign missions too, but just we got to get it well here first, right? Probably a good idea. Love. And so just indiv- corporately we love, individually. Love. Do the same thing. I disagree with somebody's choices in their life. Where can I meet them? What do they need? Serve them. Love them. You might change their mind that way. I've seen it happen. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who came today, taking the time out to do this in beautiful Naples with so many distractions. They came here. They chose to hear your word today. I thank everyone watching online for taking the time honoring the church to do that. Thank you, but I pray, I pray that you fill them with your Holy Spirit and enable them to get out there and be vehicles of love, grace, mercy, and peace in this community. I pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.